So I just come down from the east coast of Scotland, where I can tell you it's very different to how it is here this morning. So this is a bit of a shock uh, for me. Um, yes, thanks, thanks for the invitation to be part of this colloquium. Just a chance to be together with three other speakers to talk about this important topic. I decided to focus on uh, a research project that's ongoing for, for two reasons. One, because I think the subject is an important one for us to raise today, manumission, because it's one of the distinctive features of slavery and economic reform. And secondly, because I think this is an interesting example of one of the ways in which research can advance our knowledge of the ancient world. And that's namely by learning from other fields and drawing on their methodologies. So in this case, from the field of demography, which I found very useful in thinking about the problem of manumission. Now we all know that Romans manumitted slaves, that is, freed them. Um, Many writers, ancient and modern, have thought that the scale at which they did so was one of the distinctive features um, of Roman society. It's certainly the case that if you go into any museum that has a Roman connection, you will find countless epitaphs, the majority of which are probably commemorating persons who were freed, were enslaved, and then freed, um, like this couple um, on this epitaph here. But that language is all dancing around the central question. Um, just how frequent was manumission in the Roman world, and how do we know about it? And, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. And I'm going to very briefly um, just give you a sense of where I think the field stands, necessarily brief and simplistic given the time, um, and then talk through some of the ways in which we might be able to advance on that. Now, almost all work on manumission for the last half century or more has been explicitly or implicitly responding to a very important paper written by the great Hungarian epigrapher and historian Geza Alfodi, um, which is one of the first evidence-based studies of manumission in, in, in Roman society. And he compiled a database um, of epitaphs of slaves and free persons. And one of the things that struck him was that older slaves are essentially invisible in this database. Right? So for example, in the city of Rome, uh, of 340 slaves whose age of death is known, only 1% were over the age of 40. Um, that struck him as extraordinary. And he thought that the only explanation was that they had all been freed by that point, right? and that's why we don't see them. And hence he came to the conclusion that manumission was almost automatic for those who reached the age of 30 or certainly 40, at least in the cities, he conceded. Now, we all know better today um, there's a great article by Keith Hopkins called Graveyards for Historians about why epitaphs are a terrible source for demographic history. Because the information we get from epitaphs just doesn't tell us anything about the actual profile of a population at, at death. And one problem is that only a fraction of Roman period epitaphs include an age at death. And it's usually put there for those who die young. So the population whose age is known is disproportionately young anyway. And there are all sorts of other biases that come into play when we look at the enslaved and freed population. We have to remember that the epitaphs we see are commemorating people, or the epitaphs we see are those of people who were commemorated with a stone monument that's going to preserve a text that would survive uh, to the present day. It's easy to imagine that a person who had sufficient favor in a household to be freed relatively young would be much more likely when they died to be commemorate, commemorated with such a stone um, grave monument than somebody who was still enslaved in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. So I think it's clear that all these evidence didn't, didn't prove his point. And so all recent scholarship on the subject has pointed to the fundamental flaws in his argument and has taken a much more negative um, approach to the scale of manumission. Um, so Keith Hopkins, the same person who wrote about graveyards and historians, um, he argued but while it's very uncertain, he guessed that only among, that the slaves who secured uh, freedom were probably just a minority. They're perhaps a substantial minority. Uh, Thomas Wiedemann, in a very important response to Alfildi's article, came to the conclusion, or insisted, that manumission was not regular, it was not frequent, implicitly responding uh, to Alfildi. And around Henrik Moritzen, uh, whose magisterial The Roman Freedman is the best is the best survey of this evidence to date, and the most devastating sort of critique about all these arguments, uh, acknowledges the slave, that manumission is more common than in other societies, but it says that it is not neither universal nor automatic. Now, one of the things that strikes me as interesting 
is that this trajectory that we can see within our field, as we've moved from a model of thinking that manumission was very common to insisting that it was not regular or not frequent, the same trajectory can be is followed in scholarship on slavery and manumission in, in 18th and 19th century Brazil, another context in which people had thought manumission was practiced widely. So if you went back to the early 20th century, you'd find the classic works on slavery in the Americas insisted on widespread manumission being a distinctive feature of the Brazilian regime. And the key figure here is a Brazilian sociologist, uh, Gil Gilberto Freire. You know, in writing in the early 20th century, he looked at the state of race relations in contemporary Brazil and contrasted with them with what he saw in the, in the, in, in the United States. And he thought um, that race relations in Brazil were far less conflictual. And he came to the conclusion that this represented a very different trajectory, a very different history of slavery in the two countries. So he thought the less conflictual race relations in early 20th century Brazil were the legacy of a different kind of slavery that was more paternalistic um, in its treatment of slaves and that involved much higher levels of manumission. Now his vision of contemporary Brazilian society came to seem naive to the next generation of Brazilian sociologists who realized that race relations in Brazil were just as problematic as elsewhere in the Americas. And as part of rewriting the sociology of Brazil, they also rewrote the history of slavery in Brazil to undo some of the contrasts that Freire and the people who were influenced by him had drawn between slavery in its US, in its Anglo-Protestant form and slavery in its Brazilian or Latin American form. So they rewrote that, and among the, among the the elements of that revision um, were rewriting or reconfiguring this, the role of manumission in Brazilian slavery. So the two books, on, the two people on the right, Mary Parash and Katia Matoso, are two of the most influential studies of slavery in Brazil, both focusing on urban contexts where you might expect manumission to be very relatively common. And you can see they're both very definitely reacting negatively to the sense of widespread manumission in a way that is very like what's happened in our own field. So Mary Karash critiqued what she thought were the previous generation's beliefs about the ease and frequency of manumission in Brazil. And she came to the conclusion that the bias of society was not in favor of manumission. And Katia Matoso came to the conclusion that in reality, very few slaves were set free. Even more interesting is the way in which these two trajectories don't just parallel each other, but they have, in a sense, reinforced each other. As historians of slavery in antiquity and historians of slavery in the Americas have met each other in the context of comparative projects and compared notes. So I've put up here two very important comparative studies of manumission, which look at both antiquity and the Americas. One edited by a, an ancient historian, a Roman historian, Mark Playwright, and the other edited by a historian of the modern Americas, Robin Blackboard. So Mark Playwright, in his introduction to the volume he edited, came to the conclusion that all the evidence at our disposal for the moment prompts us to argue that most large-scale slave societies were predisposed against manumission. I think you can see there actually an, e an echo um, of the language of Mary Karash on Rio de Janeiro, which talked about them being biased against manumission. And in coming to that conclusion, he was influenced not just by his own work on the Roman Empire, but by observing that students of slavery in Brazil are already starting to question the premise that manumission there is frequent. Similarly, Robin Blackburn, an Americanist, um, but writing about slave societies in general, came to the conclusion in his introduction that manumission levels were everywhere rather low, and reached that conclusion not just by reading work in the Americas, but by observing that many scholars are suggesting that the number of cases of manumission in Imperial Rome was always small, and that the majority of Roman slaves never won their freedom. Now we as Roman historians probably know enough to realize that Robin Blackburn probably shouldn't be putting too much weight on the conclusions of Roman historians given just how limited our evidence base is. And the, the same is actually true of many mission in Brazil. And we might imagine that they have far better data than we do, but they don't actually. Their data is slightly better than ours, but it's problematic in all sorts of ways. So we too should be careful um, in, in placing too much weight on the conclusions they draw. And so the, thing, the things I would simply like to observe, and this is necessarily a simplification, but I think it, I think it is a reasonably fair description of 
to the state of the field as we are now. Uh, one is that in both these fields and the comparative work, conclusions tend to be framed negatively. And why? Because we're re the reaction is against a previous generation of scholarship that had insisted on some high level of manumission that was never quantified. So we, we learn that it's not universal, not regular, not frequent. And the conclusions are qualitative rather than quantitative. What does frequent mean? And what does regular mean? And these have come together to a tendency to flatten out distance between slave society. So we arrive at formulations like most large scale slave societies are predisposed against money emission, or money emission levels were everywhere rather low. Now I've come to the conclusion that the, if, if that is a fair representation of the consensus in both fields, it's somewhat misleading. I think there were much bigger differences between the various societies I've talked about now. And I think we need to recognize those differences if we're to give an adequate account of slavery and in these contexts. And I think the root problem is one of reason. It's about not having the right concepts or the right framework in which to think about the scale of manumission. And here is where I think we can usefully learn from other fields. Because I think we can turn to demographers for a better framework in which we might think about these questions. So I think, intuitively, whenever we're asking ourselves these questions, it always boils down to something like, what proportion of enslaved persons were freed? Like, this is what, like, what always comes down to, some sense of proportion or probability, like, or what was the probability that somebody would be, would be freed? And hence the various formulations I've showed you before about people suggesting that maybe the majority were never freed. But it's not really clear, I think, what that question means, and, or how one would measure that proportion. <laughs> and so one way to clarify matters would be to think about an analogous um, phenomenon, um, and that would be marriage. Now marriage is an, uh, analogous only in a very limited sense, in that marriage is also a life cycle event. It's a life cycle event that some people go through, but not everyone, and that normally you only go through once. Right? You, you enter the world unmarried, and then you either you leave the status of never being married, either by marrying somebody or dying. <laughs> Similarly, enslaved people start enslaved, and then they end up either um, freed or they die enslaved. So in formal terms, these are two similar processes, where you have two, two forces operating <laughs> in the population. Manumission and death, in our case, mar marriage, or strictly first marriage and death, in the case of, of marriage. So we might learn a little bit about manumission by asking ourselves a different question. Um, so what proportion of women or men in the Roman world um, married, or married at least once? You all know something about this, so I'd encourage you all to just take a guess at answering that question. It's not, I'm not so much interested in, where, in what particular number you arrive at, but about the process you use to answer the question. I think it might be useful in thinking through how we should answer the question about manumission. And the reason I do so is because demographers have been thinking about marriage for a long time, right? So we have an awful lot of very smart minds that have been directed to studying marriage with vastly more data than we have available. And they've come across some very clear, useful, simple frameworks that help to clarify what we mean when we talk about scale in marriage. Um, and I think the most useful framework is what I call for simplicity here, the first marriage curve. Um, and this is just a curve um, and we'll control this for either men or women in any particular society. And it's a curve that shows what proportion of the survivors to any given age are married by that point. Obviously, we start with 0% married at age 0. It stays 0 all through childhood until you reach whatever point, whatever age in that particular society marriage, the first marriage begins. And then it starts to rise. And across lots of societies, you find a very similar S-shaped curve. Um, as marriages first start, or going to be slowly, in the, in the earliest stages of marriage, then you reach the most common ages of marriage, and then it plateaus at some point. It might be 100% in societies where almost everybody marries, or it might be considerably less. This particular curve is drawn for Roman Egypt um, by Roger Bagnall and Bruce Freer, based on the census data for Roman Egypt, which is some of the best evidence we <coughs> have for, for the demography of any ancient population. And so this describes a situation where marriages begin around 12, and marriage is approximately universal by 40. Um, but you could draw this curve for other societies, 
and, or, or the same society at different periods in time. And this is then a very useful way of thinking about how societies differ in their marriage regimes, or about how marriage patterns change over time. So with this as a framework, we might then turn back to the question that I, I posed beforehand. Um, what proportion of women married at least once? I think when we have this framework in front of us, we realize there is no single answer to that question. There are multiple ways one could answer it. So for one way of answering it would be to say that in that Roman Egypt was a society that practiced universal marriage by, say, age 40. And that by around 40, almost all women in society had married. Um, so we could say it's near universal, but we would have to give an age. We have to say by 40, because 100% haven't married by 30. Right? So what matters is we can ask by age X what proportion are married. But there's a different way we could answer the question because not everyone is going to survive to age 40. And in fact, in the ancient world, mortality rates are extremely high. Again, based on the Egyptian census data, um, Bagnall and Freer put together what is our best evidence for mortality in, in any ancient population, and arrived at the model in which 50% of all persons ever born die before they reach the age of five, and only about a third of people ever born reach the age of 30. And so what we could do is put together what we know about mortality in the population with this curve and ask ourselves what proportion of, um, I've drawn this curve for women, so we could say what proportion of females ever born in Roman Egypt ever married? And the answer then is certainly not going to be 100%, it's something like 42% if we combine what they believe about mortality with what they believe about marriage. 42%, 100% by 40. Those are two equally valid answers to the question. They just answer it from slightly different perspectives. The 42% answers it looking forward from birth. It says, what proportion at birth, what is the probability that you will eventually marry as opposed to die? That's 42%. 100% at 40 is looking back from some age, asking, well, if you survive to age 40, what is the chance that you will have married? Now, I personally have found this framework very useful in terms of clarifying what we're really talking about when we debate scale in manumission. Now, the first thing I would say, and I, I think this is reasonably fair, that if you go back to the various scholars I quoted earlier on, we're talking about, say, the proportion of, when they, when they made claims like most slaves were never freed, it's not at all clear which of the two perspectives they're, they're taking, whether they're saying most persons born into slavery never freed, i.e. they died before, before they could be freed? Or are they saying that by age 60, most have never been freed? They don't specify. So my sense is they're probably, either they're probably taking the sort of the perspective from birth, or they haven't thought it through. But it's, they haven't clarified it. And without clarifying that, one can't really, uh, one can't hope to advance um, debate on the subject. Because there is no intrinsic contradiction between Keith Hopkins' claim that most persons, most enslaved persons died enslaved, and Geza Avoli's hypothesis that manumission was near universal, near universal by 40. It's perfectly possible they're both true, and that one is just simply a, describing manumission from the perspective of birth, and the other is simply describing the situation from an age like age 40. So marriage is useful because for any, any manumission regime, <coughs> so we might say manumission in Roman Egypt, it, in the first and second centuries AD. We might talk about manumission in Brazil at some point. But for any given society, there's going to be a manumission curve that is analogous to the first marriage curve and shows for any given age what proportion of survivors that age are free as opposed to enslaved. And I think that when we were debating, was manumission common or not? How frequent was it? Was it more common in some societies than others? We're really debating the shape of this curve. And the question is, you know, can we approximate the shape of this curve for different societies? And how similar or how different do they look? So a lot of my work on this um, over the past three years, and it's been a very iterative process, and then I've gone back and forth between demography and the evidence to try to find a framework that works. Um, and I've encountered all sorts of pitfalls on the way. Um, I've also spent a lot of time working on the Americas, um, 
both because they, 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 I think, face similar challenges to us in terms of thinking about how to conceptualize the problem, but also they do have better data than we do. And so it's important to test some of these methods there to validate that they work before trying to apply them to the less, uh, less well-documented Roman case. But I wanted to give you just some suggestions of where this, result, where this research could lead. So these are my best approximations to what the manumission curve looks like uh, for various different societies. Uh, it's stressed that these are still preliminary because, like I said, there's this constant back and forth between the evidence and the methodology. But if we were to look at the state of Virginia just before the American Civil War, Virginia is one of the largest and oldest of the slaveholding states. Its manumission rate in this period was approximately the same as the average in the US South. So it is a fair, it's a fair case that Virginia is typical of the American South, or at least average for the American South uh, just before the Civil War. This is what the marriage curve, look, sorry, the marriage, the, the manumission curve would look like um, in the American South. So even at extremely old ages, like 60 or 70, only a few percentage of enslaved people would be free. So on any definition, um, slavery is extremely uncommon or unfrequent um, in that society. A second example would be the British colony of Barbados around 1820, just after the British Parliament introduced a system of slave registers in order to prevent people circumventing the ban on the slave trade, um, which produces an extraordinary sort of demographic record um, of the enslaved population. And Barbados is the second largest of Britain's colonial possessions after Jamaica. Um, it's also fairly average in its manumission rate, so I think Barbados is, sort of, is representative or average or typical the British holidays in the Caribbean, and we find there that manumission is actually, you, you perhaps surprisingly, um, more common um, than in Virginia, but that the proportions free by old age are still extremely low uh, by any standards. A third example, Brazil. Um, this is a, about a decade and a half before the final abolition of slavery, um, and just after the introduction of a new national census, um, which makes it possible to quantify things for the nation of Brazil as a whole. Um, the manumission curve looks something like this, um, where we, do, we start to see a significant fraction of the enslaved population being free if they survive to something like age 60. So that's about a third freed by age 60. That is significantly more than in the US size of the Caribbean. Right? So even for Americanists, it's important to recognize the scale of the differences between those societies. But again, on either definition, it's still only a minority um, of enslaved persons would ever be freed. And then lastly, the Roman world, um, where the only, the only curve I yet feel confident putting on a chart um, is for Roman Egypt, where we have the best evidence. In some ways, we actually have better evidence for Roman Egypt than we have for the US South um, or for Brazil. You might be surprised. Um, we have a combination of two things. We have the census data the same data that Bagnall and Freer used to look at marriage and, uh, and mortality. And we also have a number of surviving manumission documents um, that speak to age at manumission. And what sets the Egyptian and Brazilian material apart from the others is that in both cases, the state keeps track of, keeps track of ages very well. So for the Roman census, you need to declare the ages of enslaved persons as well as your family members, just as in, uh, as in the British Caribbean, they're, they're checking everybody's age. So that makes it possible to to delineate these curves in more detail than one can for some of the other societies in the Americas. So I think Roman Egypt does look signif significantly different than any of those American examples, and even Brazil. So to the best of my ability to reconstruct, we're looking at a situation where about two thirds of enslaved people who survived to old age, 60 or 70, would be freed. But there is another interesting feature of this curve in comparison to the others. And that's how low it stays for quite a long time. And I, th I think this is, a, this is a, a configuration that is the characteristic of the Roman world, or perhaps anti antiquity in general, that is characterized by relatively high levels of eventual manumission, i.e. the proportion of survivors to old age who are free and by that point, but at the same time relatively late manumission, that those who are manumitted tend to be much older when they're manumitted, and there is much less manumission in infancy or childhood. And a, a corollary of this is that one can have a system with relatively high levels of manumission, 
and soon ensure that most of the children born to enslaved women will be born into slavery. So you can have a system that will reproduce itself even without significant, um, even without significant dependence on slaving of other populations um, uh, outside the centre. So Sorry, I think. Is that because you know, in Brown and Asian Centre and the Rising World, that it's mostly manual labour by the time someone's 40 plus, they're actually not much good in the labour market? I'll come back. Yeah, so the, the question of explaining like things is quite, is quite large. I'll come back to that. Fate, you know? well, I'll come yeah, back to, to that after raising questions, if that's all right. Um, <coughs> what they, uh, just a, a, a slight digression is that it is interesting if one goes back to the Caribbean. Um, what, there is the, the story proliferates that manumission was often given to very old slaves. And the interesting thing is that story actually originates with the planting class itself, which is trying to come up with uh, a rationale in order to introduce a high tax on manumission and make manumission less common. Um, so they suggest that manumission is creating this big burden on the state by uh, by having masters by emitting relatively old slaves, um, whereas the evidence actually shows the contrary, that, not, that those who were manumitted, the minority um, in the Caribbean, tend to be relatively young. So at least in, in the Caribbean, the, the sense that it's the elderly, the invalid who are um, manumitted, was actually a, a myth constructed by the planting class in order to restrict manumission. So I think, I feel that we as historians of slavery can do more and need to do more to make these differences visible. Um, and I personally think the only way forward is through quantification, but also through having the appropriate conceptual framework, which we can draw from, from, subject, from scholars who've studied similar or analogous processes in more detail than we have. Now, I've focused on methodology, sort of quantification to this point, because I thought in some ways it might be interesting, insofar as it illustrates this one way in which advanced research can advance our knowledge of the ancient world. Right, which is by making conceptual advances or borrowing concepts um, from other fields. But I can't possibly leave the subject of manumission there without warning against the danger um, of turning this graph into a very facile argument. Uh, you know, it's very easy to fall back into older ways of suggesting that societies that practiced large levels of manumission were somehow better um, or less savage or more meritorious than those who don't. Again, if we went back to the early 20th century, um, Luther Porter Jackson, pioneering African-American historian of the free African-American population of the American South before the Civil War, it seemed intuitively obvious to him that the story of my mission represents a cheerful and humane side of the institution of slavery, it represents the master and the slave at their best. It even seemed intuitively obvious to David Bryan Davis, um, one of the sort of great figures in the world history of slavery, that the ease and frequency of manumission would seem to be the crucial standard in measuring the relative, relative harshness um, of different slave systems. Now, it is obvious to most of us now just how naive those positions are. And so I think it is very important that we don't use the graphs I just put up to reproduce these kinds of stories. It is now blindingly obvious that the relatively high levels of manumission we find in the Roman world are in no way incompatible with the savagery and brutality, you know, just as bad as anything we will observe in the American South. One just had to think about the importance of the, the whip and the cross as symbols of slavery. Think about the casual violence deployed by Roman slaveholders. One might think of the story of manumission as a cheerful one, but remember that we only see sort of the, the, the manumissions we see are the manumissions that were carried out. And we have to imagine that there's a whole shadow history of broken promises of people who expected manumission but never received it, um, perhaps because the slave owner renege, reneged on a commitment, or perhaps because the slave owner died and they passed to heirs who had no intention of honoring that agreement. Um, one of the most infamous moments in the history of Roman slavery um, happens when the prefect of Rome, uh, the prefect of the city, Pedanius Secundus, uh, under Nero, is murdered by one of his slaves which triggers one of Rome's most brutal laws, which provided that whenever a slave owner is killed in his own house, um, all of the enslaved people living under the same roof will be executed as a punishment for not having, for somehow being complicit in the murder. And so because of Pedanius Secundus' death, 400 enslaved people are put to death 
um, against the outraged cries of the, 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 much of the populace uh, of the city of Rome. Now, Tacitus suggests to us that one reason, one of the reasons that might have triggered the original killing of Pedenius Secundus himself is that he'd reneged on a promise of manumission um, to, to, to the slave who killed him. So we have to imagine this whole shadow history as one of the manumissions that we see. We also shouldn't idealize what manumission means for the enslaved person. Um, Henrik Moritzen has done more than anyone to show just how much, just how often enslaved, freed people remained in a position of dependence, still living in the same household, still carrying out most of the same tasks. The freed people we see tend to be the wealthy and successful because they could put up these stone burial monuments. We have to imagine all those who eked out marginal lives, having spent much of their savings on purchasing their manumission. And we have to recognize that ultimately manumission was practiced at this scale because it served the interests um, of the slave owning class as a whole. And I better leave it there. Thank you very much.